Hallelujah. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Jehovah Jireh. My provider, Jehovah Nisi, Lord, you reign in victory, Jehovah Shalom. You're my prince of peace, and I worship you because of who you are, Jehovah Chira, my provider. Lord, you reign in victory, Jehovah Shalom. You're my prince of peace, and I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Today I want to talk about being transformed by grace and grit. Transformed by grace and thank God for grace. But I promise you, I've lived a long time for Jesus. And there's been a lot of things I just had to grit them out. If you don't know what that means, well, you're going to be educated before you leave. Don't worry. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I'm reading these two verses from the Amplified Version of the Bible, and here's what they say. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself set apart, as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational or logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed. Say that word with me transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts as we look further into it today. The word transformation from verse 2 is what God does in our spiritual person as we surrender and submit to his will and ways. Transformation is defined as a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. When our form of mental recognition changes and we recognize Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and Jehovah God as our eternal Father, out of that recognition will flow 
a life of eternal length and eternal significance. Praise God. Simply put, it is the grace of God at work in our person and being, changing and reshaping our character, our will, the way we live our lives. And don't, 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 lose, don't lose that thought. There is a certain way God expects us to live our lives. I didn't get any amens, but thank you, Brother Harold. I can change my mind, and I often do. Sometimes Sharon changes it. But only God can change my heart. And He will. He does. He has in the past. And when I surrender to Him, He does a more complete work that makes positive, helpful change in my relationship with Him through my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a testimony, in case you wonder. It's a true testimony. Life gets worked out day by day, sometimes hour by hour, moment by moment, second by second. Life gets worked out. I titled the sermon, Transformed by Grace and Grit. Now I want to talk about grit. Do you have any grit? You know, we live in the South and we know what grits are. But the word grit is defined as this. Courage and resolve. Strength of character. Other words associated with it are bravery, pluck, Say that word with me, pluck, or metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, metal. You know, we use that to say, well, I meddled in so and so's affairs. Pluck is about the ability to take hold of something and work at moving it along to a working, functioning, worthwhile purpose. People with Pluck, quote unquote, are people who do not quit until the job is done. In other words, successful function is achieved. Amen? In many cases, pluck requires a great deal of bravery to achieve the goal in mind. We've got to add some bravery to it. Often those who are engaged in their work are working against opposition, against resistance. Resistance that will test one's mettle or persistence in the process of reaching that desired end or goal. Quitters are not winners. I'll say that again. Quitters are not winners. So if you want to win the spiritual battle of the soul, then you have to persist to the end of the process. There's no other way to do it. We've talked about transformation. Now let's focus for a little bit on the word reformation. Reformation. Reformation is the action of reforming an institution, process, or person so that he or she or it becomes adapted to a particular need, time frame, or situation. Compliance with a plan is important to success in endeavors that require groups of people to work in harmony together. 
feel like I need to repeat that. Not, not because of you, but more because of me than anything else. Compliance with a plan is important to success in endeavors that require groups of people to work in harmony together. There must be a plan and there must be adherence to that plan. It takes a lot of grit to go counter to the mainstream of public opinion. While the church is tolerated by the world today, it seems to me most of the time that the world today thinks they have the church on a short string and can reel it in any time. But my intent, my sole purpose in life is to prove that's not the way it is. As the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, our work in this sin-cursed world where we find ourselves is to influence others by living out our faith given to us through saving grace and explained in this book. And what is this book? The Bible. The Bible. That faith should be resistant to the demands and ways of the world. It is of great importance that we understand that we do not answer to the world. We answer to a higher authority than that of the world, which is a temporary, ever-changing place. Depends on who's president. Depends on who's your congressman or woman. The Bible says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So the kind of faith I'm talking about is found only here in the Bible. It's only here. It's not in all the books, countless books, that have been written over the centuries of time. Imagine that God-given faith lived out in a sin-cursed, sin-committing, sinful living world where there are seemingly no parameters nor barriers to rein in the acts of sin could and does have impact on the sinners who live there. Imagine that for a moment. The fact that you live according to the choices in this book, influences others as you live it, breathe it, sleep it, perform it in the world where you are. Now, we are, and if not, we should be, front and center before a world gone mad because of sin and its license taken by so many who disregard God, who disregard His Word, biblical truth, and who disregard foundational faith that this Bible provides for all who will subscribe to its practices and precepts. Transformation is not an easy process. Sometimes it's very tedious. But we must surrender to it. And we must apply our own personal energy, strength, and will if it gets accomplished in our lives. While human action is not always cooperative with divine will, when it is, life always works better and is a much more pleasant experience. 
If you get cross with God, you are just going to be cross in your attitude. So it pays to stay right with God. And I say amen too. And I say amen because I know. I know when you get cross with God, He's going to let you figure it out for yourself. I understand reformation to be the effort to remake oneself as an acceptable form to God, conducive, compliant with His will or His purpose in life, and that is discovered through the search of the Scripture. You know, I just I want to say this because I think it's important for you to know. You don't just get up one morning and decide you're going to be a pastor. I got up one morning and decided I didn't want to be a pastor. But God wouldn't leave me alone. He wouldn't leave me alone. So I quit a great job on the Seaboard and Coastline Railroad and went to work for the kingdom. Been doing it ever since. And I'm not telling you how many years that is, if you don't already know. Forty-six? That's, that's, I'll take that. Oh, you're just going to tell it, aren't you? <laughs> okay, let me finish the sermon. It's God's purpose for our time here upon the earth that we seek to comply with and implement His will into the order and flow of our lives. And God has a purpose for that. He works together in harmony with us and us with Him through the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It, it's the only way the church of the Lord Jesus Christ can survive and thrive. And God didn't put us here so that it would be just us four and no more. He put us here to rub shoulders with the world that needs saving and to bring the power of grace to bear upon the lives of those. Really, the, the biggest challenge we have is to live that grace-filled life in the everyday world where we live. That's, that's the challenge. While there are no connect points between us all, that does not mean we are cookie-cutter productions with no personal identity that sets us apart from others. Even though we are part of a larger group as individuals, we all make up the body of the church, and each one contributes his or her gifting to the efforts of the local church body. And that's not all. Thereby, by that, a church functions and succeeds in kingdom work and should be making an eternal difference in her community of residence. Amen. I love to think about this building on this property being a witness. Amen. But I know the only thing that makes what happens here a witness are the people that it happens to regularly and faithfully. That's you, that's me. When it happens in our lives, it is too big to contain. You can't contain it. If you do, it's like 
fruit that dies on the vine because it's been there too long. We need to disengage from the building and engage in the community. Say, well, pastor, you mean I don't have to come back to church? That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. What I said is, when you leave here today, don't think of church as this building. Think of church as a moving, ever-changing shape in the community because as people are added, the church grows and the function of the church enlarges. And the greatness and grace of the church expands. I'm about to get excited here. (laughs) I done lost my place. I have no clue where I was. While there are connect points between us all, that does not mean we are cookie cutter productions with no personal identity that set us apart from others. Even though we're part of a larger group as individuals, we all make up the body of the church. And each one, each one, I think I already read this, but you don't remember it and I don't either, so I'm going to read it again. Each one contributes his function and success in kingdom work is achieved and accomplished. Success that's making an eternal difference in our community of residence. Reformation is what you and I do with God's help. Our mindset as a Christian changes because of the influence of the Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. When we encounter God through a salvation experience, the Bible reforms and speaks into us, especially a surrendered heart, the energy of God's presence and the power of His Word, His will, His ways. We, quote, reform and, quote, re-energize our approach to God. Have you seen a Christian that was so excited about God you just couldn't hardly stand them? I pray for more of those. I would like to see a house full of those. People so excited about God, they just cannot contain themselves. I pray that one day you'll come and you can't find a seat. And I pray that when we start having those kind of services, they will multiply and grow to 8.30, 10.30, maybe 12.30, or or give a lunch break and come back. (laughs) Yeah, I I wonder too if I have the strength to do that, (laughs) but I'm willing to try. Are you? Amen. We we reform and re-energize our approach to God, that is, to finding and executing His will for our lives through searching the Scriptures and through praying to Him and surrender to His wisdom and guidance throughout the process as we seek to alter and reapply our strength and energy through His counsel and instruction. I can do what I think is right, or I can do what I learned from this book that is right. That is, this is what brings transformation when you practice what it says. 
There was a time in the 1500s in the history of the German church when a reformation is recognized to have occurred. In 1517, when Martin Luther, a German monk and university professor who lived from 1483 to 1546, posted his 95 thesis on the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church in Germany. This is a real story. Luther argued that the church had to be reformed. The 95 Thesis he wrote eventually became the foundation of the Protestant Reformation. They were written in a remarkably humble academic tone, questioning rather than accusing the writers of those things that were taught in those days. Nevertheless, the document was still very provocative. Got Martin Luther into trouble. As Protestants and Pentecostals, we owe a debt of gratitude to men like Martin Luther. It was Luther who tirelessly worked to translate the New Testament into his native language so that all could read and knowingly embrace the truth recorded in the Holy Scriptures. Why would anyone want to keep the Bible away from people? But that is exactly what was happening. And Martin Luther did his best to try to take care of that. Now I want to consider two or three observations and and then we'll close. Faith and the eternal role that it plays in our lives is what brings positive change, divine change in our world. Just hold that thought in your mind. Faith is not just fact. It is biblical fact. Faith is not just fact. It is biblical fact fact. Faith is the substance of our biblical hope. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, those before us obtained or secured a good report from God of their lives. They didn't do it because they were good. They did it because God was good and they believed on God. Amen? Amen. By faith, those who came before us demonstrated to us how to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 40 and Going through chapter 12, verse 2, says this. Actually, I've got 39 in there too, so here we go. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Jesus didn't come back. Even though they were believers, he didn't come back. They died. They were buried. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. You know what that's saying? God didn't want them to have what he wanted you and I to have today. He wouldn't give to them what he wanted to give also to us. You think about that. Verse chapter 12 And verse 1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, let me just get a real technical here and explain to you what that verse means. It means that all those people who died in Christ before us are up there in heaven right now. They know exactly what is going on on earth with the kingdom of God because they see it. They were part of it. They still are part of it. And they're looking at you and I, thinking about us. 
I don't know if they pray in heaven or not, but I imagine it's something like this, that those who are up there must be asking God to help. God, just help old Dennis Langford. He needs all the help he can get. Just, just help old Wesley Stout. He needs all the help he can get. Bob Menzing. Anybody else want to say something? <laughs> I nailed Harold a few seconds ago, Diane. So. These scriptures are so wonderful to me. I have so enjoyed reading them over the past few days. We are, we are compassed about by that great cloud of witnesses. So it encourages me and, and, and you as well to lay aside the weights of sin and the world that distract us, ensnare us, and run, run with endurance the race set before you. And the only way to run it is keep looking to Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And you know why he's there? Make an intercession for us. So, let's consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you we become weary and discouraged in our souls. You know how, you know, that, that verse is telling you how to keep from becoming weary and discouraged in your life. And it's really very simple. Consider Jesus. That sounds like a great book title to me, Molly. <laughs> Consider Jesus. Jesus. Consider his life and how it impacts yours. Consider his life and what it models for you. Consider his presence and being that is still alive today and available to all who will call upon him. Amen. Consider. We need to consider those trailblazers who marked the trail for us to follow. We need to consider the way of grace that was modeled through their lives that they lived. And we need to consider the assurance of their faith practice. That means what it affords us today in the circumstances of our own lives. And literally translating what those verses are saying, I tell you that there are many times today in my life as I move forward, I think about what my parents taught me. I think about what many people who have influenced my life over the years spoke into my life as I grew up around them. My grandparents... Friends, ministers, pastors who mentored me and spoke into me. I owe every one of those who has touched my life a debt of gratitude that I will never be able to pay except that I continue to move forward in what they helped me to become. The assurance of the faith of these that are heroes of the Bible tells us some very important things, not the least of which we can make it because they did. We can make it because as God helped them, God is helping us. We can make it. It says closing. 
I will concede that sin is fun for a season. But the further you go into sin, the tighter the noose gets around your life source. It keeps going until you are so bound that there is absolutely no freedom in life anymore. You're a slave to everything and anything but Christ. The person given to sinful acts, ways, and thoughts is hopelessly bound and cannot change themselves even if they want to. Only God can change a sinner and bring eternal salvation into their hearts. Only God can replace the terror of sin with a peace that transcends all understanding. Only Jehovah God can grant the forgiveness that cleans the slate and washes away the terrible power of sin and its marks upon the heart and soul of those who have walked in the ways of sin. If you're a sinner today in need of a Savior, the only thing that stands between you and God is you giving Him permission to save your soul because He is ready. He is ready. He is willing to receive you right now as His child willing to birth you into his kingdom because he loves you. Well, Pastor, there are no sinners here today. Listen, all of us are sinners saved by grace. We're all in need of a Savior every day. Not just one time when he saved us, but every day we need a Savior. I can't tell you how many times in the course of a day I may recognize, yeah, Lord, you just saved me from something terrible right there. You just saved me from something bad. You saved me from something tragic. How many times on the highway as you drive do you watch people who are foolish in their driving? That too. And you know if God had not been with you, they would have probably run into your vehicle and you wouldn't even be here to talk about it. God is good. All the time, God is good. He never sleeps. He doesn't have to sleep. He watches us while we sleep. Keeps us safe. I don't know why, but the older I get, the more I think about and I'll just be honest, worry about somebody breaking into my house. And when I, when I start doing that in a few moments of time, I'll realize I don't need to do this. God is my protector and I've asked him to keep my house. And if I don't Stop this, he's going to believe. I don't believe that he will. I don't want that to happen. So I put that away. I try to not just put it on the shelf. I try to put it out of my life. Got to get rid of it. Jesus loves you. He loves me. And he wants all of us to know him, to experience his love, and to be blessed by his presence and power. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today for every person in this house. I thank you, Lord, that these people are your people. They love you 
And they've proven that to me over a long period of time. Not only that, Lord, but I know they love me. They wouldn't put up with me if they didn't. And I give you praise for the friendship, the fellowship. Father, I ask you today to use us. Use us for your glory. For the glory of your kingdom that we will help to build the kingdom through influencing our neighbors, our friends, our family, people we don't even know by a kind deed, a spoken word, a smile, or simply a pat on the back. Father, in Jesus' name, use us for your glory and your honor today to build up the kingdom of God. Jesus, we know you're coming. And we know that you don't know the day nor the hour, just like us. But we know that one day the Father's going to say, it's time, go get them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that day. But we pray as long as as time continues, that you will help us to bring in the sheaves. Help us to rescue the perishing. Help us, O God, to bring positive, powerful, divine change into the lives of our neighbors, our friends, the people of our community. Father, I'm sincerely and humbly asking this in the name of your Son and our Savior who died for all people on the face of the earth, shedding his blood. In his name I pray and ask these things, O God. And everybody said together, Amen. Amen. Now I know there is food in the back. I'm not sure what the status is, but if you just keep your eyes peeled this way, you'll know when it's time to go to the back and enjoy some food. Amen? Fellowship together and uh, somebody will go back and figure out what's going on and you can come back and tell us when we need to go.